Yeah, welcome everybody to the first panel for today. And the name of this panel is Nishida and Political Philosophy. And our two speakers are Jan Strassheim and Holger Söderström. Ah, great. Good. Yeah, I think we won't lose any more time and start. It's about 20 minutes for the speech and 10 minutes for the discussion. But yeah, we can adjust that if you like. It is probably going to take like 25 minutes, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Mm. Yeah. So. Right. Um, <clears throat> thank you so very much. If um, I have difficulty speaking up, so if you cannot hear me, I, I would ask you to come to the front. So sorry about that. Uh, is, is it okay this way? Um, uh, so I'll just read this out because I, uh, I tend to lose my train of thought. Um, when the name Nishida Kitaro comes up in the context of political philosophy, people sometimes become uncomfortable. On the one hand, Nishida has been acclaimed for suggesting how the inner dynamics of a culture and the exchange between cultures are geared towards an open world, arguably a cosmopolitan vision. On the other hand, Nishida has been criticized for wartime texts in which he connected philosophical concepts of his own with the language of a government promoting an ultra-nationalist vision of cultural identity. One sometimes gets the impression that there are two Nishidas, and the hottest discussions are between people who aim to identify him with one or the other. One might see this as a matter of the history of philosophy, which was specific to the political situation at the time. Nevertheless, the question is of renewed relevance today. Whatever people mean by globalization is being more and more perceived as a threat, and all over the world, calls to strengthen local identities are being translated into government policy. There is a growing tendency to close borders around states, nations, cultures, religions or ethnicities. Clarifying Nishida's stance in the 1940s is a challenging task which I will not even try to undertake here. But against the background of our present situation, an equally important task might be to continue clarifying what Nishida's philosophy can mean today. To what extent can Nishida be taken to support or to question an emphasis on particular identities, which is suggested as an antidote to globalization. I will approach this question by attempting to isolate one conceptual juncture. I will focus on a possible ambiguity in some of Nishida's arguments. This ambiguity can be tied, on the one hand, to different readings of the word individual, and correspondingly, to different readings of the word universal, which may be relevant to how we look at the phenomenon of globalization. These readings, however, do not point to two different nishidas, but they can be reconciled within the same philosophy, I believe. The interpretation I will suggest is based on arguments made by the contemporary philosopher and literary critic Karatani Kodin. Looking through Karatani's lens, I believe, can contribute to a continuing dialogue with Nishida as a productive thinker in the field of political philosophy. At first sight, it may seem strange to draw on Karatani here. This is not only because Karatani, with his deconstructivist influences, seems to do a completely different brand of philosophy, but also because he criticized Nishida in connection with the political implications of his work. At the same time, however, Karatani presented Nishida as an early forerunner of deconstructivism, and if one looks more closely, parts of Karatani's own philosophy can be read as an implicit dialogue with Nishida, even where Nishida is not cited. This somewhat ambivalent attitude of Karatani's may, in part, reflect an ambivalence in Nishida's own writings. I'd like to point to one such ambivalence by using a distinction Karatani draws in his 2001 book Transcritique. Although this book does not even mention the name Nishida, I think that some of the argument 
contains echoes of Nishida and can be projected back onto Nishida in a fruitful way. Mm, the basic problem has often been remarked on. There is in Nishida a tension between a universalist reading which emphasizes the unity of mankind and a more particularist reading which emphasizes group identities. This tension can be found already in Nishida's 1911 book Inquiry into the Good, in Japanese Zen no Kenkyu. In this book, Nishida describes the individual as carved out of the fullness of what he calls pure experience. This fullness of experience is far richer than the individual's identity, more narrowly understood. It also connects him, or her, with other individuals. This is because when I succeed in accessing pure experience, I step beyond the rigid distinctions which define my identity as an individual and which separate my identity from that of other individuals. In pure experience, the other person is no less and no more a stranger, right? No more, no less and no more a stranger to me than my own self of yesterday is a stranger to myself as I am now. At the same time, Nishida sees an important role for collective distinctions, such as those of, particular, of a particular state, society or language. Collectives such as these shape the individual identities of their members and, as evident especially with language, allow them to understand each other in a shared world. Mm. Hence, the individual stands in two kinds of relation. Under the aspect of pure experience, the individual is in principle related to all others through a universal connection. Under the aspect of group membership, the individual is connected to all other group members and only to them. There is a tension between these two aspects because in the second relation, the individual is connected to certain others through shared distinctions, while in the first relation, all individuals are connected by transcending such distinctions. Against this background, the role of social distinctions is ambivalent. As might be expected given the universal connection of individuals, Nishida sees us as developing towards what he calls the ideal of a society of mankind, in Nishida's words. This ideal transcends any particular group. But at the present historical moment, he says, it is not a reality. In this perspective, if you happen to be a citizen of a particular state, this state is merely a step on the way to a society of mankind. At the same time, Nishida repeatedly refers to Hegel and underlines the lasting role of the state in world history. States, he writes, form a collective consciousness which is at the origin of the individual consciousness of their citizens. He even says that individuals develop as cells, and this is a biological term here, of a society, as if a society were a large body with an individual identity of its own. These two basic ideas continue to compete with each other in Nishida's later works, and both are elaborated further. Nevertheless, the side of particularism seemed to have a growing advantage in this competition, which was hammered home to Nishida by some of his students. Nishida's description of an immediate relation between the individual and the universal may be a metaphysical achievement, but at the level of social and political reality, a society of mankind remains only an ideal. What is real are nations, states, cultures or languages, their effects on the individual members, and their role in shaping and coordinating concrete experience and action. On the level of reality, the argument goes, Hegel was right in saying that an individual is always the particular instance of something more general. This level of generality holds a central place, still according to this argument, because on the one hand, it relates to the universal, which would remain empty unless the general realized some of its possibilities. On the other hand, 
The general relates to the individual because it, it the, the general, expresses itself in those individual instances which fall under it. Hence the individual is related primarily not to the universal but to a generality such as the state which mediates between the individual and the universal. If this argument is true, a society of mankind will either remain an unfulfilled ideal or it could at most be realized as a world state or as world domination by a particular language or culture. This seems to be quite similar to the notion of globalization which is articulated today by many who wish to strengthen cultural or national identities. I now turn to Karatani's critique of the broadly Hegelian argument which I just sketched. Karatani does not deny that the particular and the general necessarily refer to each other. However, he notes that these two terms should not be confused with another pair of terms which is quite different. The second pair is singular and universal. For example, when we see an individual person as a German, we describe them under the aspect of a particular characteristic which of course presupposes some general idea of being German. But when we see an individual as singular, we do not describe them at all. The singular is a something, a thisness, which escapes all general determinations. As a singular, an individual is not regarded as an exemplar of some type or as a carrier of a function. Therefore, it cannot be replaced by any other individual. The role of the singular and its relation to the dimension which Karatani calls universal becomes clearer when we consider how he describes the first pair of concepts. Right back to general, general and particular. The general and the particular form a circle of mutual determination. Describing an individual as German implies a general con concept. Conversely, this general concept of being German is exemplified by a number of particular individuals who have certain characteristics and only insofar as they have these characteristics. Any other aspects of these individuals are excluded from the circle. Now the modern nation-state, which for Hegel of course was Prussia, has gone a long way towards perfecting a system of many such circles uh, interlinked with each other. Um, like educational curricula, jobs, offices, elections, laws, registers, contracts, terminologies, etc. Anything outside of the system is irrelevant, indeterminate, irrational even, when seen from within the system. This, however, means that the system is closed on in itself. It cannot make sense of anything outside it, or even of any variation within the system. A different culture or a dissenting member standpoint can only be understood if a general category exists which can be imposed upon it. All aspects which, which fall outside the scope of such categories will simply be neglected. The other is either assimilated or ignored. But in reality, not, not even the totalitarian state is perfectly closed on in itself in this way. At least sometimes there are impulses to break out of the circle of the general and the particular. And a central resource for such impulses is the individual which is not included in the circle, which indefinitely exceeds it, in other words, the singular. Now, if seen from within the system of a perfectly regulated state, what individuals do outside the system is a private matter. And indeed, to the extent that the system regulates the channels and even the language of the public sphere, um, the individual's singularity cannot become a public matter. But the singular individual addresses itself to a public which is quite different in kind. Karatani says, still talking about Karatani here, with reference to Kant. 
this public is universal in the sense that it transcends any circle of particularity and generality and is therefore open to the possibilities beyond such circles. According to Karatani, an individual who, within their own community, addresses herself to a public which transcends any community becomes a cosmopolitan in the Kantian sense by taking this attitude. This analysis has implications for what a universal public can be. It cannot be built within a particular state or community because it transcends all communities and um, any consensus within their borders, even a general consensus. But it cannot be built by forming a world government either because that would just be a very big community. Instead, Karatania argues, the encounter between the singular and the universal happens in an essentially transitory field which he exemplifies in the dimension of space and that of time. In the spatial dimension, the encounter unfolds in what Karatani calls, uh, quote, the space between communities, unquote. That is, it happens when different circles interact without yet having general concepts to categorize the other's behavior or appearance or whatever. Karatani refers to traveling, living in a foreign country and meeting foreigners in one's own country, or reading texts produced in other cultures. Such encounters can help unsettle seemingly self-evident concepts and provide access to the dimensions of both the singular and the universal. As Karadani exemplifies in the thought of Descartes, Kant and Marx, and we might add Nishida. In the dimension of time, a universal public is always a future public. The Kantian scholar, for instance, writes for a public of future critics who will continue to scrutinize his or her arguments from as yet unknown angles. In both dimensions, it is the nature of the universal, just as it was with the singular, that it does not exist if seen from within the circle of the general and the particular. As for space, to the extent that the relations between communities become regulated on both sides, they lose their openness. As for time, when the response of a future critic can be expected and conceptualized within my argument already now, it has already been drawn into the circle of the general and the particular. In this sense, the universal exists only as an ideal which remains outside the palpable reality of nations and states. But this is precisely what allows the universal to function as an impulse which introduces changes into this reality and allows it to be open. I now return to Nishida and try to apply these conceptual tools to his philosophy. The relation between the singular and the universal, as described by Karatani, resonates well with some of the argument Nishida makes in his 1932 paper, I and Thou, Watashi Nanji. When I encounter another person, I may simply impose upon them general categories I have for people. By this method, I will grasp the other as an individual of a particular kind. But I will not grasp them in their singular individuality. In Nishida's terms, I will grasp the other person as a relative other, but not as an absolute other. In order to do this, I must break up the continuity of my own categories, which in their regular application turn everything I touch into an instance of some general pattern that I already have. The singular other can only be found beyond these categories. However, these are the same categories which shape my own particular identity um, and my own particular individuality as a member of a state, nation, language, community, etc. Their continuity continuity of those concepts, um, is part of what gives me my stable identity 
as a member of these collectives. Therefore, when I break up the categories that I restrict, the categories that restrict the other to a particular individuality, I also break up what restricts myself to a particular individuality. In Nishida's words, I encounter the absolute other within myself. Hence, in encountering the singular other, I also encounter my singular self. This is essentially the position that Nishida had already taken in his inquiry into the good, when saying that pure experience reveals a connection between individuals. With the distinction stressed by Karatani, we can say that this connection is universal in the sense which relates to singular individuals and which is very different from the generality of, say, a state. Nishida's later analyses make it clearer how the spatial dimension in which I encounter other individuals is related to the temporal dimension in which I encounter earlier and later versions of myself. Kratani's examples of these two dimensions tend to emphasize rather extraordinary and historical settings, the meeting between communities or the Enlightenment writer who writes for future critics. Uh, Nishida's I and Thou focuses on an encounter between two individuals which can happen anywhere in our ordinary lives and even within highly regulated communities. As for the individual, he or she is no doubt shaped by social formations such as states or national languages. But this concerns only the individual seen as a particular in correspondence with general determinations. The individual as a singular escapes all general determinations and, what is more, it is a resource for challenging and changing these determinations when it turns towards the ideal of a universal humanity. There is a tension between these two dimensions of an individual, but there is no contradiction which would force us to give up either one or the other. To be sure, the universal dimension of mankind does not exist if seen from within the general dimension of a state or a village, but as Karatani suggests, this ideal character is the nature and the power of the universal. Now if we include the singular and the universal dimension, it seems to me that the circle of the general and the particular should not be understood as the centerpiece of Nishida's theory. If seen from within this circle, both the singular and the universal appear as nothing, a term which is both used by Nishida and by Karatani. At the same time, these two dimensions contain within themselves an infinite richness of possibilities. All general and particular determinations and any system of such determinations merely realize some of those possibilities. In this sense, the relation between the singular and the universal contains within itself all possible circles of generalization and particularization none of which can necessarily claim a central mediating position. One might object that this argument fails at least in one area, and that is language. Habermas, for example, uh, would argue that the language we grow up speaking provides shared rules which enable individuals to communicate with each other, and that we cannot subvert this linguistic community because then even if we wanted to express our dissent with everything else, nobody would understand us. Therefore, language at least should hold a central place in mediating between the singular and the universal. Uh, furthermore, language casts doubt on the very idea of singularity. Hegel rejected the singular because we cannot express it directly. Most words of a language denote general concepts which can be applied to particular cases. But if I wish to avoid any determination of this something in general terms, then, as Hegel puts it, I can mean this something, perhaps by pointing at it, but I cannot, quote, say what I mean, unquote. 
if I were to say this German or, or even this person, I would already be describing the singular as the particular case of a generality. Karatani does not deny this. He points out that the only words in the language which can refer to singularities as such are proper names, such as Socrates or Mount Fuji. However, language too is a system which needs to be open in order to apply to a potentially infinite variety of situations. Philosophers of language and recent research in linguistics have shown that what we say in terms of a closed semantic system can never fully determine what we mean. In the most casual everyday conversation, we implicitly supplement or bend the rules of our language without even noticing that we do so. And even when we use words to mean strictly and literally what we are saying, the rules of our language alone do not indicate this. In this sense, we can never say what we mean, to use Hegel's phrase. The fact that we nonetheless understand each other much of the time indicates that we communicate at a level which is both below and beyond language as a system of generalizations, but which is crucial for language to work as a means of communication. To grasp this level, a conception of the singular and the universal might prove fruitful. I come to the conclusion that... that does the ringing sound we have here? enough time um, if I look at this schedule, we have basically two hours for two presentations, right? One and a half. So, yeah. Wow, so... Time. So just take your time. Great, thanks. Yeah. It's just a conclusion <clears throat> anyway, so... Um, many who react against globalization today presuppose that the circle of the general and the particular is inevitable and that we can only choose between either coming under the rule of some world-dominating power or reinforcing local collective communities and identities. Reading Nishida with Karatani would suggest that the kind of cosmopolitanism which lies in the relation between singular individuals and an ideal universality would avoid both of these options. What is more, the cosmopolitan dimension so described is primary to both of these options since it includes them within itself. The cosmopolitanism of this kind is in principle already at work within the relation between a particular individual and the general characteristics of the group of which he or she is a member. While collective identities are real and powerful factors in shaping and coordinating individual identity, there cannot be a strict and closed identity. According to Karatani, economic or political crises can expose the fact that no system of generality and particularity can represent either the singular or the universal dimension. But for the same reason, a frequent reaction to such crises, which is to seek refuge in a closed identity that is supposed to represent everyone in a nation or culture, is ultimately based on a fantasy. However much influence such, such calls gain, from a philosophical standpoint, I'd say, they are chasing an illusion. The singular individual, called by the proper name Nishida, holds many facets, and his texts will be interpreted differently in different places and at different times. Taking the cue from Karatani, I think there are good reasons for political philosophers today to cite Nishida as a proponent of a cosmopolitan view which speaks against any pure particularism, both on a global scale and on a local scale. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan Strassheim. We have now plenty of time for questions. Or yeah, oh. and yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, very interesting the <coughs> relation between the universal and the particular and the singular and the individual. One of the uh, interesting things about Michel, I think, is, is, is uh, how he 
goes about the individual and the singular is through the body and actions. There are the historical situated um, actions that actually defines the person that cannot ever be universalized mm. because you are a particular singular being. Yeah? It, but it's not simply a concept, but it's like a real lived body. Yeah? And whether in Karatani, that historicity of the embodied self is also um, there, that was my first question. And the second question is, this historical body, that is the self, yeah, in the, as the singular, that is also uh, free, yeah, absolutely free in Nishida's term. That means you are even able to negate the uh, cosmopolitan ideas, yeah, because all ideas can potentially be negated in these uh, Nishida's dialectic. That is the power of these the singular, yeah, that can even negate the, uh, the universal. Um, if that's the case, then uh, I think uh, that's actually what's happening in a crisis of the globalization today in that certain groups who become um, so fanatical groups. Uh, they have that power of negation of all yeah, in order to assert itself. So I think that's the crisis. Yeah? And I wonder what you would uh, want to say about this, uh, this kind of absolute power of negation that comes from this uh, position of the singularity. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Nishida is, I, I, I'm not sure about the Kalatani, um, but at least in Nishida there is this element yeah, of the, uh, the, the instant negation. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that comes a, bit, a little bit later than the Ayan uh, Dao, uh, fundamental problems. Yeah. Mm, thank so you. Maybe that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> mm, thank you very much. The, 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 those are fascinating questions. Um, I believe, but anybody who knows Karatani better than I do, please correct me, that the body does not play um, uh, such a fundamental role as it does in uh, Nishida, especially with respect to uh, singularity. But um, I think this could very well be combined as sort of um, uh, in Nishida, as you say, um, the body is also the medium um, which contain, which expresses the spatial character of meeting the other person, which is both a separation and a connection. Um, and it is also a carrier of this um, uh, fullness of pure experience and then of being in the world with a body um, and it is um, what distinguishes the individual from a from a collective because um, sort of e even if Nishida sometimes says sort of we are cells of, of society was well, in another place he says well the difference is that society doesn't have a body um, so that's that's why society is also uh, sort of all forms of social interaction or collective identity presuppose this um, this sort of singular and universal dimension as that which makes them possible. And ultimately, and this I believe relates to the second uh, part of your question, that's why we can't evaluate um, this dimension of either uh, Okay, because all the evaluations build upon it. So um, those people who deny a universal um, a dimension and try to sort of build this absolutely rigid uh, identity, perhaps even a fascist a totalitarian identity, um, they may negate sort of verbally this dimension, but they still presuppose it, and they still need it for their for their fascist vision, vision to to function. So that right. So, for example, understanding the other person sounds nice, but if I want to um, to deceive or manipulate you, I also have to understand you. So it, it's the basis for both. Um, Yes, that, that was quite a rambling uh, answer, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Fred Davis. Uh, thank you very much.
understand this problem in the political terms of uh, in later Nietzsche's writing, the writing that you're focusing on. We have to go all the way back, though, at least to the, the uh, Basho essay and to his attempt to work out this logically and to his attempt to develop uh, what he calls the Jitsuko Manoni, the logic of the predicate, where he's trying to think precisely for the relation between um, the particular and the general and the singular and the universal. And so I think he's really sort of pushing that, trying to think logically, and that's all in the background of family terms to think in social and political terms. Mm. So I think it just might be really helpful to, to clarify a lot of the things that you're saying by, by going back and, and, and tracing that through. Thank you. My, my question is about the um, ambiguity of the individual, um, that we can mean by individual um, both the, the particular and the singular. Now, maybe I was mishearing um, what you were saying, how you were saying it, but it seems to me that part of the, what's interesting and difficult is that those can never be separated. We can never separate the singular and the particular. It's not as if we have the singular sort of individual here, and then that singular individual is going to sometimes take on the particular characteristics. But rather, uh, any individual is always going to be both at once uh, particular and singular. And for that very reason, there can be um, a circulation between the general and the particular. If the particular had no singularity to it, it had no creativity, one might say, what Nishida calls the gyakubinde, or the, the power of counter-determination, then there could be no circulation. It would just be top-down determination. And so it's because that singular always uh, inhabits the particular, you could say. And so if we think sort of concretely about, say, an individual person, if you were to take away from that individual person all of those generalities, you know, the German, male, this, that, right, it, that person would not, you know, would not be able to say, I'm, I'm me, so to speak. Those very much sort of determine, and yet not exhaustively. That's why there's a singular that, that inhabits the so, do you see what I'm saying? I think what's interesting and difficult is that those cannot be uh, separated. Is that, am I disagreeing with you all? Or did I just mishear? No, I, I, I completely agree with you. That's, um, um, they can only be separated analytically. And even, even once you do that, you realize exactly what you're saying, that, um, that one depends on the other, sort of if. I don't know, it works as a metaphor, although it's probably a very wrong metaphor, but you could say that the singularity is the material and the generality is the, the particularity is the form. So take away one and you lose the other two. That, I believe, is a wrong metaphor, but... Uh, yeah, that metaphor takes you back to Aristotle. Yes. And what Nietzsche calls the logic, the shoe on the mm. which he's very sympathetic to, right? Because that, he thinks that Aristotle's logic pointing at the singular, that you know, it's called the singular. Yeah. So I think that, that that actually is a helpful metaphor to try to think what he does with the logic of the predicate at the same time. Mm. Yeah, thank you, I'd have to look that up. I, I mean, in, in Aristotle you have um, probably some of the early ex earliest expressions too of singularity, right? Like this toddity, this uh, right. something there. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, please, the last question, unfortunately. Uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, the, the first question is uh, uh, rather uh, simple. Um, I'd like to uh, know um, where Karatani, um, uh, Karatani uh, has said uh, that uh, Nishida uh, he, uh, characterized Nishida as a uh, I propo uh, early proponent of uh, deconstructivist uh, thought um, uh, in what terms and what context. Uh, I'm asking this uh, uh, partly because uh, Karatani um, is not always uh, comfortable uh, with the characterization of uh, uh, deconstruction. Uh, he, he was uh, he, his he was clearly influenced by uh, deconstruction, Derrida and Dumas, uh, but at the same time, uh, he's especially um, uncom 
comfortable uh, with, uh, especially with the Japanese reception of deconstruction. De so uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that in what sense he uh, uh, made this characterization. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and the second question is that uh, uh, about uh, Nishida's uh, no, no, uh, Karatani's uh, discussion of singular and universal. Um, <coughs> he uh, first uh, extensively talked about uh, this question in uh, Tanku, uh, and uh, in close connection with the uh, question of the other. And uh, he emphasized uh, 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 the asymmetry, asymmetry or dissymmetry uh, of the relation to the other. So, uh, and in my understanding, uh, that asymmetry is uh, closely connected with uh, the singular. So, um, on the other hand, uh, as far as I understand, Nishida in his Wareto Nanji uh, talks about the other, absolute other, uh, which seems to be uh, his uh, view on the uh, relation between uh, I and other uh, is rather symmetrical. So, in, uh, in that respect, uh, uh, the difference between Nishida and Karatani is quite uh, large. And, uh, mm. uh, so, I, I wonder if um, uh, Karatani's uh, view of the other um, uh, is uh, um, closely uh, similar to Nishida. Mm. That's, that's second. Thank you. Um, as to your first question, um, to, uh, quite embarrassingly, I'm not, sh not sure where he writes it, but um, I remember the context, and, and it's exactly w what you say. It's, a, it's really a critical reference. Oh. Sort of Nishida was a proponent of uh, deconstructivism, avant la lettre, and uh, that's why people in Japan like him so much, because sort of uh, in the West, deconstruction sort of dissolution of the subject is seen as something progressive, while in Japan uh, people yeah, exactly. can say, okay, now, ah, now we can get rid of the subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it, w it was in this, this collection called um, Materialism as Humor, uh -huh. where he also criticizes Nishida for, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, as to your second question, yes, I, I, I believe you have a point there. Um, the, this asymmetry, um, a part of this asymmetry is also connected to this, uh, to this importance of the future dimension, I believe. So sort of, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for the other person to do something, but I have no idea what they're going to do. I'm not expecting anything. The only thing I know is it's probably going to be different from what I expect. Um, that's clearly an asymmetry which is not there in Nishida. But then if you imagine sort of a social situation in which both people do that, sort of both waiting for the other to do something, then really nothing is going to happen. So, um, so maybe you could, you could combine these two situations. To sort of, it's probably more Luman now than, than Karatani, but so, so something, anything happens and then one of the two uh, takes that situation and then something develops and maybe it develops in, into an asymmetrical relation. But it's true, I, I, I would also, I would side with Karatani there and say the asymmetrical relation is, um, is a more important um, also because usually um, um, communication is asymmetrical, one person speaking, the other listening, and then 
people taking terms, so, that, so that's all, always there. Sorry, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much again. I think we have to close close now the question time. And my apologies, I haven't introduced you properly. You received a de degree from the Freie Universität Berlin, Free University Berlin, and now you're a lecturer in Japan at Keio University. Yes. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah.